I want to thank you all for coming this morning to join us with the One Book, One City program. And I want to say that this program would not be possible without generous community support, such as Friends of the Library, the Sierra Madre Civic Club, the Sierra Madre Rotary Club, and the Sierra Madre Community Foundation. Um, this is not a line item for the library's budget. It's all through sponsorships and donations. We're able to get speakers, provide refreshments, and being how is generously um, enough to donate coffee for today. Thank you very much for being here. We're very excited about this program featuring Mr. Dan King, a World War II historian that specializes in the Pacific War and author. So without further ado, let's give him a round of applause. For this Thank you, Alice. I appreciate that nice introduction. Before we begin, I'd like to show a brief video that explains what The Last Zero Fighter is all about. Zero Fighter is available on Amazon, but today we have a special discount for museum visitors. It's twenty dollars today for one to buy. If you want. But uh, we have a uh, slideshow. I want you to show. And I named the book The Last Zero Fighter because almost all of the men I interviewed were the last members of their squadron, and in some cases, the last members of the entire air group. They were still alive. They're all in their high 80s, early 90s. The oldest is 96. This book uh, is about the experiences of five former Japanese World War II aviators. And the reason why I wrote this book is that I wanted to get their experience. You know, there, there are people who collect coins, for example. And when you get a new coin or you buy a new coin, you always flip it over. And that's something we really haven't done very much in America, is look at our former enemies' experiences in battle. There are a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings. And actually going to Japan, talking to them in their own language, reading their letters, reading their memoirs, and getting their first-hand experiences growing up in Japan, training in the Navy, and in combat, and getting their understanding of what the war was about, and what they were fighting for. And I thought it was really important to share that with fellow Natives, you know, Americans and Canadians and British people who speak our language because the Japanese language is so difficult for us to crack that it's been 70 years with very little information coming out of Japan. So I interviewed these five naval aviators to get their experiences. And I prepared a brief slideshow to show you. 
Okay, who am I? Why am I qualified to write this book? That's uh, basic information. I first went to Japan when I was 16. I had a scholarship to uh, the state of California. <coughs> I spent 10 weeks over there. I got my degree in Cal State LA, Japanese. I worked for Toyota in Japan for 10 years in the administration department, plant administration, at the plant that made the Corollas, which I drive. I love Corollas. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, I break hard. They actually made us work on the line for three months straight because they believe in something called Genshi Genbutsu. The Genshi Genbutsu means look and see, go and do. It means go to the site. Don't just read about it, don't just listen about it, go to the site. So in the factory, when problems happen, which they do, workers and ties all rush off to the line and they get their open sleeves and they work on it. And that was something that I learned really young, was to go and see. And I've applied that in my research, is going to interview the veterans, going to the battle sites, where they actually fought and trained, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, Wake Island, Midway, Singapore, <coughs> Nanking, all these places I or we, my wife and I, have been to to research and study firsthand and to see what these veterans actually experience. So I've met over 250 Japanese veterans. I qualified for the Japanese Ministry of Education's Level 1 efficiency, which is the highest of four levels. And I've interviewed 97 Army and Navy veterans. I've interviewed Privates and infantry were drafted weeks before the war ended, and I've interviewed uh, admirals. I, I've been a consultant, I think their language historical for uh, a lot of films, documentaries, the EA video games, and the National Park Service in Guam. We set up a brand new museum out there. And thanks. Okay, so why interview these pilots? What's the point? Why? Get a clear understanding of history, learn about the myths, the legends. As I mentioned earlier, every coin has two sides, and we only learn about our side of the war. And gain a great appreciation for our American World War II veterans and the sacrifices that they did for us. Like if you're watching a boxing match and you see one big, you know, boxer and he's beating up a little kid, what's what's the, what's the excitement? What's the valor? What's the glory? When you have two equally sized boxers fighting, well then, that's something you want to learn about. Okay, Japanese Navy aviators, aviators they're, they're qualified into four different categories. Uh, there's the pilots, and then there's the observers, who are actually navigators, and they're also plane captains, radio man gunners, and flight engineers. And I'm going to do all four. <coughs> in the path to the cockpit in the Japanese Navy, is there are basically five ways one can get in to the cockpit. Go to the Navy Academy, Join the College of Naval Reserves, become a civilian pilot, join the Navy as an enlisted man, or join the Navy's youth program. And I'll explain this a little more. And as there were three basically types. There was the, the pilot, the navigator observer, and the radio man gunner. And once one became a pilot, depending on one's skills and test scores and aptitude, one would become a fighter pilot, dive bomber pilot, a torpedo slash high-level bomber pilot, or a multi-engine aircraft pilot, like the Betty Bombers or the large seaplanes. Okay, here, I'd like to address a few myths and uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions right off the bat. Is the kamikazes flew zeros and only zeros? Well, in actuality, they flew everything. In fact, the word kamikaze can refer to the guys who ran under tanks with mines you know, strapped to the chests, guys who were in submarines, uh, guys who were the suicide hard hat scuba divers who would walk out into the beach with weighted shoes and, and scuba helmets with, with modern scuba gear, and they would walk out with this big long pole with a charge attached to them, and their job was to hit the landing craft from underneath and blow up the, the U.S. Marines as they came ashore. Uh, and then the rocket Vaka bomb, called the Oka, uh, I, am, I interviewed two men who are assigned to Baka bomb uh, duty. This is uh, a rocket is carried aloft by a Betty bomber and it's dropped over the target. And there are three engines, three rocket engines. And these young men uh, basically aimed the rocket at the target and punched off the uh, rocket engines. And then there was the speedboat pilots, the Shinyo. <coughs> the Shinyo pilots were given these little Toyota motorboats, they had Toyota engines in them, packed with explosives and they were to come out of caves and launch towards the American landing craft. 
and attack them. And I've interviewed these men as well. Uh, this is something that shockingly someone mentioned to me on Guam last year. A gentleman said to me, we were talking about the book, and he said, oh, you know the Japanese pilots, they were all welded into their cockpit so they couldn't get out. That's why they crashed. And I was, I was amazed that this person believed this. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not you know, a, a welder, but I don't think you can weld aluminum. But beyond that, I think if you're saying that someone is forced into the cockpit and chained in or given some kind of like drugs or welded in, they could just sit there and say, I'm not going to do this. The person has to be motivated to want to do that. And kind of, it's, a, it's a, not a quite, the correlation is not perfect, but the surviving Japanese pilots <laughs> themselves as first responders or last responders. And to say that they were forced to go on their missions is kind of like saying that uh, in New York on 9-11, the firemen, they rushed into those Twin Towers. They didn't have cops behind them with guns forcing them to go in. The firemen ran in, and their goal was to save lives. Their goal was to save um, other New Yorkers. And the Japanese men that I interviewed their, their object was to save Japan, to save the Japanese people. That was their motivation. They were motivated by anger or hatred or revenge. Nearly all of them talked about my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother. It was going to happen when the Americans would land. We were going to be slaves. And they were told that, that we were going to enslave them. So they believed, it's not true, but they believed that they were saving their country from this invasion. Pilots didn't carry parachutes. This is not true. You know, this, this is a model of the Zero. This is a Type 21. And the way the seats were designed in the Zero is they had like a bucket seat. And so you have to have a parachute to sit on. Or else you would just, you'd be like, you know, you'd go beneath the, the top of the surface you couldn't see. So they always sat on parachutes. And what the, the difference was, they could choose to hook into their parachutes or not. And if they chose not to hook in, if they were uh, flown, you know, kicked out of their airplane during a dive or a crash, then they wouldn't become captured. And that was a big issue with the Japanese, as I'll explain in a moment. His capture was forbidden. It was not discouraged, it was forbidden by their code of ethics. And so Japanese often, when they would fly over foreign uh, alien territory, enemy territory at Pearl Harbor, they didn't wear harnesses at all. They said, if I'm going to crash, will not allow myself to become captured. I will just go right into the drink, or if I get uh, kicked out of the plane, I'll just you know, hit the water. And the reason why, the Japanese had a code of ethics called Senjin Kun. And I'll just read this. This is chapter, uh, section two, chapter eight, and it's titled, Value Your Family Honor. He who knows and thus seeks to avoid shame is strong. Be vigilant, ever mindful of your family crest, making the utmost effort, even unto death, to avoid suffering the shameful crime of soiling your name by being taken alive as a prisoner. The Japanese were taught that if they were allowed to become captured, become prisoners of war, their families, their towns, their neighbors, their schools would all be horribly shamed. And their names would be stricken from the family record at the town hall. Well, the Japanese can trace their ancestry back a thousand years or more if they live in the same towns for generations and generations. And the temples and city hall all keep their names in logs and records. If you became a POW, your name would be scratched out with two red lines, and you're out, you're done. No one will speak of you anymore, and your family would be shaved. It was a big deal. So they were taught from the time they joined the Navy or the Army, you will never allow yourself to become captured. This explains why so many killed themselves. Yeah, the kamikaze were a special unit trained through the missions. In actuality, they were often the least experienced, the most expendable members of the unit. There are no living kamikaze pilots. You know, this, this is kind of a joke. People say, you know, well, how, how can you interview a kamikaze pilot? They all have to be dead. Or they were, you know, they were terrible kamikazes, you know. Or, or, you know, and I understand that. I don't again. But, you know, there were a lot of kamikaze pilots who went out on missions but had engine trouble and had to come back or couldn't find the enemy, had to come back. You know, intelligence is very, very important. And if there's a sighting of US you know, ships at a certain point, and the kamikaze take off, that information could be stale, could be hours old. 
And if they head to that point, the U.S. ships have already moved away. And a, land, a time with no radar, the only way you can find an enemy is by line of sight. So these pilots would head out to an area where they thought the U.S. Would, fleet, would, fleet would be, and there's nothing there, empty water. Or they would get attacked by uh, uh, fighter pilots from the aircraft carriers, get shot up, and they'd make their way back. And there were cowards, too. There were kamikaze pilots who, who claimed engine trouble and landed at different airfields and would buy themselves a day or two while that mechanics checked out the aircraft. And I had some interesting conversations with some of the pilots who were very angry about some of their, their squadron members who did that. Okay, another myth is that the Japanese pilots were all officers. Like in the U.S., the officers had to go to college. But in Japan, they joined the service. They could join at age 16. And they would go through this program called the Yokore for two years and become an 18-year-old pilot. And many of you know that Japanese guys were given daggers. And if you see these things on eBay or in museums, will often say suicide dagger, kamikaze dagger. But these were very ceremonial, beautiful daggers. I got a picture of my book here. Um, and they were meant to be given to the parents in exchange for their son's life. They were signed by the admiral. And they were, they were precious keepsakes. They were never meant to be used to, to commit suicide. And were usually sent home to the families right away. I've seen, I've held, and I've pictured myself with one of these daggers with one of the, the Kaiten suicide submarine pilots who survived. Okay, so who, the last zero fighters. There are five men who are in the book that I interviewed. Yes? George, it had on the script in the last slide the pilots carried a pistol for this purpose? Yes. That's how they committed suicide. That's right. Yeah, the, the pilots carried pistols. They were issued uh, either Type 14 Nambus or Type 94 Nambus, uh, or they could purchase their own. But they would use these to kill themselves rather than be captured. Not for defense, but for, and they usually you know, have one magazine. And uh, Mr. Harada, who, who comes up next, actually talks about wanting to kill himself when he was uh, in the water. Okay, the first is Mr. Harada. He's Japan's oldest living fighter pilot. He's 96 years old. And next is Mr. Isamu Miyazaki. He passed away recently. Mr. Haruo Yoshino, ensign. Mr. Toshimitsu Imaizumi, and Mr. Tomokazu Kasai. Mr. Harada is still with us, and Mr. Kasai is still with us. The other three have passed. <coughs> Mr. Harada joined the Navy in 1933, at age 16. <coughs> he served aboard the destroyer, he served aboard the aircraft carrier as a maintenance man. Cool. He dreamed of being a pilot. The road to becoming a pilot was closed for him at that time, so he joined an aircraft carrier. Finally was accepted into the Soren Aviation Force and became a fighter pilot. These are some of the battles he participated in. was the USS Panay. Anyone familiar with that? In Nanking, with the Japanese bomb, uh, American and British ships in, in, the, in the, the river outside Nanking. And he talks about that in the book. And I asked him straight out, I said, why in the world did you bomb our ships? It was 1937. We weren't at war. These were, these were neutral ships that were in, you know, friendly <coughs> waters. And he talks about his, 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 why they were told to do that. He provided air support in the fall of Nanking. He actually dropped bombs on the walled city of Nanking. The Japanese army was stalled. We, we visited, and these, these, these walls are like 30 feet thick. They're huge. They're massive. They have tunnels that go through them. And the Japanese army couldn't get past these walls. And the Japanese Navy was called in to bomb those walls to create a sap. Mentions that as well. Uh, he was at Pearl Harbor. He was on the aircraft carrier Soyu. He was involved in the battle for Wake Island. Uh, yeah, the paratroopers support at Andong, Australia, Aran at Midway, and uh, finally with uh, Kamikaze instructor. <coughs> and Mr. Miyazaki. Uh, he was a enlisted man as well. He served the border destroyer and worked his way up into the, the cockpit. And what's unique about him is he was in the air the day the Doolittle Raiders flew over Tokyo. He and two other men were in a three-plane <coughs> formation that were flying over Yokosuka, the combat air patrol that day, which to them was, was boring. 
It would be like flying over Washington, D.C. today for combat air patrol. There's no enemy fighters coming in. It's boring. If you'd rather be at the front, he wanted to be in combat. But he was flying over Yokosuka. And as you see in the book, moments before they took to the air that day, they were told the Japanese Army is conducting engine trials with twin engine bombers for the Kanto area. If you see any twin engine bombers, leave them alone, give them a wide berth. And so they said, okay, they put it in their logs. And as, as it's in the book, and he said they were flying. He looks down and he sees two B-25s flying towards you close enough. He says, oh, there they are. Okay. Didn't think twice about it. And then they see smoke and fire and flames, the anti-aircraft fire. And he said, oh my gosh, they're shooting at our army planes. Those are the idiots. He tried to get on the radio and Morse code back down to base and say, hey, you got those, those trigger-happy guys shooting at our planes. Tell them to stop firing. But the radio was completely jammed. Everybody was on the net at the same time trying to talk. So all I hear is squelching. So the three planes landed and got out and ran it and said, hey, you got to call the AA crews. Tell them to stand down. And he said, we're under attack. And so well, they got back to the air, took off after the Raiders, and they were caught up to them. And that was something he was so mad about. Even, even to this day, he passed, but he was, he was so angry that if he had not been given that message moments before, he says, the three of us could have easily taken out those two B-25s. Easy. He was at uh, Guadalcanal. He was in the defense of Wake Island. You know, the, the Japanese took it. The Americans tried to get it back. And he was assigned to protect the lake from us. Uh, marshals. And he saw Louis Sanfrini at Quadrilla. He mentions he was there at the exact same time Zamperini was, and he mentioned seeing the U.S. captured flyers. And he describes them. Uh, they looked all you know, haggard. Some had tennis shoes, some had baseball hats, and he described them looking not like a uniform <coughs> military unit. And he was on Iwo Jima. Before the Marines landed in 1944, the Japanese had a lot of naval aircraft that were trying to defend Iwo Jima. And he talks about his experiences there. He was sent on to uh, Kamikaze escort duty, and then he was with the 343 Air Group, <coughs> called Gendo's Blade. And he took the most experienced aces of aces and combined them into a new unit for purposely fighting against U.S. fighters over Japan. And he saw the A bomb go off in Nagasaki. Yes? Is that Gendo's Blade? Is that named after Minoru Gendo? Minoru Gendo? Yes. You know, you know, Genda was the one who actually planned the attack at Pearl Harbor, and he was given ch uh, charge of his air group, which three squadrons. Uh, Mr. Miyazaki was, was, they were given the day off on August 9th, 1945. So the, uh, the pilots took some trucks, went up to the hills, and the people. And they were relaxing because they'd been having combat for almost two weeks straight. And then we saw this huge mushroom <coughs> crowd fly go off. And he mentions that in the book. <coughs> Mr. Yoshino, he wasn't a pilot. He was the navigator slash bombardier on a torpedo bomber that attacked the Pearl Harbor. His torpedo hit the USS Oklahoma. And he describes in detail what it was like to leave the ship, circle around Barber's Point, and come in and drop the torpedo. It was the invasion of Raval, Port Darwin. He was at Midway, his ship was sunk. I'm sure everyone's seen the, the Battle of Midway, the movie, and the search planes looking for the American fleet. Well, he was in plane number two. He was the observer in number two. And he was very upset that more planes were sent out to look for the U.S. fleet. He describes that as well. He also was at Iwo Jima. He was in the Philippines. And he entered the war uh, in his uh, Sion Mert. Yes? To address the third line, number one, and the third line. Oh, yes, exactly. You know, every Japanese pilot I've interviewed, I asked the same question. He said, Americans believe that there was a third wave at, at Pearl Harbor, that there was supposed to be a third wave. And every one of them said, what are you talking about? And there was only two waves. We only had enough planes and pilots set up for two waves. And Mr. Yoshino said that when the pilots all gathered in the briefing room, they urged for an like, impromptu third wave. They said the docks were untouched. The oil tanks were untouched, the repair fields were all untouched, and they were saying, let's go back for another hit. We can, we can pull everything together and go back again. But those in charge, they said, made a decision, they didn't want to risk the fleet. 
They figure by now the Americans have a couple of hours to react. We've got to have subs in the area. We got to get out of here while the game is good. We just have to be happy with what we have. But, but there is a myth that there was a third way plan that was canceled, and that's not correct. There were two planned ways. There was a third way that should have gone out according to the pilots, but was not authorized. Yes. Um, uh, at midway in the movie, they say one of the Japanese search planes, the radio wouldn't wasn't working. They had located uh, the, the uh, uh, American carriers, the Hornet and the, and the uh, um, Enterprise. But that wasn't. This, did he say anything about his radio not working? No, no, he, he had no problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He talks about his mission that day, what he actually saw and photographed. <coughs> And Mr. Imaizumi, um, he's passed. He was also sent on kamikaze. His first combat was against the Flying Tigers in landing China <coughs> with B-40s. He fought B-24s, B-25s over Hainan, right here. Uh, he was on a Philippines kamikaze escort. He's evacuated on the Philippines, through the jungle, flew to Taiwan, and was sent on an actual kamikaze mission with the 8th Titans. <coughs> he's a very interesting person. He's one of the most animated, humorous, likable veterans I ever met. Always had a smile on his face. He talked about his friends, the good times he had, and his pal Subaru the monkey. He had a pet monkey on the but he just <laughs> loved it, like he would love a dog or a cat. He trained it. He had a leash on it. He'd stick baths with him, which caused a lot of problems. The Japanese love taking baths, as you know. And he would sneak into the communal bath. After hours, and his monkey would come in with him, and he would sit there and he would just relax. And he would actually do this. He'd say, "Oh, so we're all loved at bath time." And he said, "Once I tied him up in the barracks, because I got yelled at for coming into the bath with the monkey." And so, as I was walking out, the monkey was screaming and yelling, trying to come after me. And he bit his way through his leash, and he wound up in the bathroom. <laughs> and you hear him talk about—he called it his pocket monkey, like a Pokemon. He's a pocket monkey. He said he would sit. You know, the, the, the flight through that big pocket here, it's like this. And the monkey would slide into this pocket, and he'd walk around with his monkey sticking out of his pocket. And I said, why didn't he run away? He said, because I, I had a lot of bananas. They love these little tiny little bananas. They go crazy over them. So as long as you have a bunch of bananas hanging from the rafters, they can't reach, they'll, they'll stay there. You just give them one every once in a while, they'll never leave you. <laughs> he even took one on a trading flight with him, around the airfield, to see what would happen. He said, Subaru had his hands up, looking out the window. <laughs> oh, he was. Wasn't he scared? He was, no, he wasn't. I had a leash on him, so he couldn't jump out, but he wasn't afraid. And he talked about that monkey for a long time. Like, we got to talk about the interview more, sir. Yeah, he's very funny, very good humor. <coughs> and that's what Mr. Kasai. Um, he was one of the teenage pilots. When the war ended, he was barely, barely 19. Uh, he was on this, this flight. Um, Twelve pilots were sent from uh, Tokyo down to Guam as replacements. Twelve were sent, only two arrived, and only one didn't crack up. Mr. Kasai cracked up on landing. So only one man arrived with his plane working order. The other ten disappeared. Engine trouble, turned back just disappeared. And Kasai said he'd look over his shoulder and there'd be one less. And then there'd be one less. They're not allowed to use the radios. And with engine trouble and, and possible, you know, he I don't know what happened. And so when they, when they got closer, he said this, this is what caused a lot of the attrition with the pilots. They were so young and so fresh, didn't know how to navigate. They're following behind a navigator plane that was leading them from Tokyo down to Guam. They didn't know how to navigate. And so when well, someone had engine trouble and they couldn't keep up, they'd slowly fall back and fall back and fall back and they lose sight and then that's it. And there's navigation change, that's it. You're done. He fought on Petaluma. <coughs> he was in the Philippines fighting P-38s. Dr. Mahata fight the P-38, the best way to do it. He said it can be done. And he fought against B-24s over Yap Island. And he had some horrific experiences with three of his best friends being shot down by B-24 gunners. We said were excellent, uh, excellent shots. Uh, he also flew uh, escort missions for the Philippines and was also in Guinness Blade. And uh, he is credited with uh, 10 uh, air victories. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, if anyone had any questions or comments or observations, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, let's just go from front to back. Yes. Did they have any concept of how horrific the Japanese invasion was for the Chinese or the Filipinos or the yes. Koreans? I mean, did they, did they just think, well, you know, we were having a war and we all fought? Or do they have any idea of that or any compunction? One of the differences between the Navy guys and the Army guys at Indian <laughs> was the Army troops were usually in the blood and the mud. And they had very bitter experiences hand to hand. They saw their enemy and they were very hard. Now the naval pilots, they lived on ships, they had comfortable beds, they wore fresh clothes, they had good food, they were treated well. And they didn't, I didn't get any sense of hatred or anger from the Navy pilots that I often got from the Army guys. And one of the things I asked Mr. Harada, I said, what about Nanking? How could you all do that? And he said, what the army did in Nanking brought shame on our entire nation for generations. He was very angry at what happened. At the time, he was just told to drop bombs on an enemy fortress so that the army could take over. But when it comes down to what actually happened inside Nanking, he went in and he witnessed it firsthand. And he said he was disgusted and nauseated and, and, and enraged. If you, if you, if, I don't want to you know, kind of push it too much, but if you buy the book, the Today or on Amazon, you can read about what he saw in Nanking. And it disturbed him. It still disturbs him what he saw. Another comment about, I'm sorry, before I go on, about Pearl Harbor, was Mr. Yoshino had said he was very mad as well. Because they were led to believe that the declaration of war would be delivered before they arrived. Even by an hour, a half hour, but it would be official. They trained for months and months, 10, 12, 14 hour days for this one moment in time to attack the enemy fleet. And they believed it'd be an honorable attack. They were very proud, very proud. And then they find out later that it was a sneak attack. And they blame uh, the bureaucrats, they blame the Japanese embassy, and they blame their own government. And said what, what we did honorably was reversed and brought shame on us for generations. Everyone in the world calls Pro Harbor sneak it. I'm oh, sorry, move on to the second one. Yes. Yeah, you know the one episode you spoke of, of the uh, two engine bombers and not to attack and all of that? Is it possible we had intelligence on that or was I just lucky? That's a good question. I have no idea. It could, it could just be God looking out for us. Because none of the Doolittle Raiders were shot down over Tokyo or Japan, which is incredible to think about it. They have thousands of fighters all over Japan. It's, it's unthinkable that none would even get shot down, but none were. And that's one of those things our province, you know, was, was, it, was for us. Uh, yes, sir. I'm like hearing, uh, you talking to any of the pilots, many of them talk about the lack of armor on the planes. Yes, I don't hear yes. yes, sir, they did. No, I, <coughs> there are several weak points on this Zero. They have gas tanks in both wings, there's a gas tank right in front of the pilot behind the engine. <coughs> and while American planes would have uh, an armor plate behind the pilot, they'd have self-sealing fuel tanks with like rubber around the fuel tanks where if a bullet penetrated it, the rubber would melt and seal it up. And they had armor for the engine. The Japanese Zero had zero armor. No armor. You could knock this thing down with a 22 rifle if you had a good shot and hit the pilot. There was no armor surrounding the pilot. There's no armor in the back of the pilot. American planes often have what we call a bathtub armor, which is like your armor all around the pilot. So when a Japanese pilot was caught in a dogfight, he really did not want to be in front of an F-4 or F-6. They wanted to be behind or anywhere else but in front. So when you think about that, you think the Japanese, well, why didn't they put armor in their planes? Because from what I understand from talking to them was that their goal was offense. Offense, so you want range, and so you know, they had these drop tanks so they could get you know extra extra mileage out of their aircraft. And the pilot's safety and well-being wasn't as important as getting those bullets and bombs to the site. So if we can get our pilot down to the target, have him shoot up the place, drop bombs, if he comes back, great. If not, yeah, we got more. So they're just they're just producing pilots, producing planes, and it was really cheap and real thin but extremely nimble and very, and very fast, but no armor at all. Yes? 
Did <coughs> any of your interview subjects talk about which American aircraft they least liked to encounter? The F-6 Hellcat. They were all terrified of it. Hmm. They said, if they saw the Wildcat in the sky, he, he, Mr. Harada would say, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> but the Hellcat, they'd say, yeah, don't mess with the Hellcat. You see a Hellcat? Like Mr. Imaizumi describes, he and a partner, they were flying, and they saw a, a flight of four Hellcats flying beneath. And he said, we just watched them go by. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you attack? He said, no, no, no. <laughs> and he said, well, they were very beautiful planes. <laughs> I, I couldn't put holes. It's a beautiful airplane. It was like beautiful and blue and the beaut white stars. And I said, I was like, okay, I understand, right? Well, what do I know? And then he, he said, you know what, I wish I could have flown in one of those one day. I would have loved to have flown. And it dawned on me, he's a pilot. He wasn't looking at, that's an enemy plane, Grr, I'm going to get you. He was looking at that, what a fast, beautiful machine, and it's gorgeous. And he said, our planes by then, the paint was all peeled off, the engines were refurbished, there patches everywhere, it's embarrassing. And these planes, brand new engine, they were just gorgeous. Yes? What did they think of the Corsair? Not a whole lot of comments on the Corsair. Oh. I noticed that the Japanese referred to all planes as grumming. Like American pilots will often say, you know, everything was a zero, whether it was or wasn't. The Japanese would often say grumming, which is the manufacturer of the Hellcat. So to them, everything was a grumming. Uh, I got one, one more quick comment. Oh, yes. uh, well, two, actually. I got a book from my dad published shortly after World War II as a picture of Japanese diplomats, and it says that they had a great deal of difficulty translating the declaration of war, and that's why it wasn't delivered prior to the attack. Uh, the second comment is, following the fall of the Soviet Union, a prisoner came out, uh, and to leave out all the details, after being held in Siberia, and slave labor in a factory and everything, uh, he was a 14-year-old Japanese infantryman captured in uh, northern Korea in 1946, and he was released in 1996. Yeah. And he didn't he didn't speak Japanese anymore. You know. Yes, sir. You spoke of the, of the Japanese mindset of being taken prisoner of war and how that brings his honor and family. I was curious if that mindset changed after the war in retrospect. In other words, I know a very small percentage of POWs are taken Japanese POWs, but in, uh, in retrospect, in terms of their treatment, uh, did that mindset change? Question. You know, um, my next book will be about uh, an Iwo Jima survivor named Mr. Akikusa. His first name was Tsuruji, Tsuruji Akikusa. He was captured by the Americans at Iwo Jima. And he was told never to become a prisoner. And the prisoners who made it back to Japan after the war almost never spoke about their experience. There's no roster of Iwo Jima prisoners. There's no association of Iwo Jima prisoners. They didn't get medals. They didn't get any kind of uh, acknowledgement. A lot of them just were ashamed and kept quiet. Of course, nowadays, you know, the Japanese today, 2013, are, are not what they were back in 1943, 1940. They're completely different. And a lot of the veterans would say to me, they'd say, you know how North Korea is today, where everyone's controlled by the government, and people are marching in unison in uniforms and just kind of crazy? But that's how we were in 1941. It's exactly how we were. And there was, there was state-controlled media, state-controlled newspapers, no information in the outside world. They're educated with state-produced books, materials, and what they're told, people believe. And there's no other information to the contrary. So when they were told, if you become a prisoner, they're going to kill you and enslave you and you know, all these things, they believe it. The government's telling you this is what's going to happen. But they look back today, uh, Mr. Akikusa said, I'm so glad I survived because I wouldn't have had the last 70 years of my wonderful life if I killed myself. <coughs> Mr. Harada tried to kill himself. He, he, was, he went down at Midway, and he was in the water floor <coughs> for a long, long time. It was, the sun had set, the ships were gone, he was alone in the ocean, floating there, and he'd given up. And so he reached for his pistol, which he kept on a lanyard, and his float vest. He reached for it, and he left it on the ship when he was eating his quick breakfast. Off of his gear. And he said, I was so depressed. But I just couldn't I couldn't bring myself to undo my foot back. I just couldn't. But if I had my pistol, I would have killed myself. Yes, sir. I heard that 
the Germans in the World War II generation have, have faced up to the brutality of the Nazi regime, but that the Japanese nationally haven't faced up to the brutality of the, the army uh, during World War II. That's true. Uh, I think that's true. I think as individuals, if you talk to an individual Japanese veteran, they will all admit and say it was horrible, what happened was terrible, and there's no forgiving it. And a lot of them will blame the emperor, they'll blame their own government, they'll blame the military, and they're pretty angry. But when it comes to like government level, the Japanese government, this is, I, mean, I don't mean to talk politics, but I think there's something preventing them from acknowledging what happened, and I don't know why. But I, I, for that Maybe question, losing a face, loss of face, or something. They don't want to I'm not sure. I don't, I don't want to talk politics about because. But this book is not about politics. There's no um, spin. There's, it's not revisionist history. It's not. This is how it should have been. This is not my opinions and my comments. This is what the veterans told me. And so, this is one of my promises to them. I would say, whatever you tell me, I'll put in the book, good, bad, or whatever. I'm not going to edit out your comments. Um, if you saw something really horrible at Nanking, I'll put it in. And so I did. You had good time with getting drunk, getting a fight with the uh, Japanese Kenpi time. You got thrown in the brig. I'll put that in. And that's in. That's in here. So, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I can tie this fight with the police, don't they? You <laughs> <laughs> fought the MPs too? And they sure did. Uh, and then we have yeah. one more or two more, two more questions. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Oh, sir. Yeah, you did a lot of interviews for your book. How difficult was it to broach the subject of World War II with your subject? It was very easy. And I think the reason why is uh, these, these guys had been quiet for, for decades. And they usually not talking to their wives or kids about their experiences. They only talk amongst fellow veterans. So I would show up, and I'm, I'm basically a stranger. And you can talk to a stranger easier than you can with your own kids. And my theory on that is, if you tell your wife and kids horrible things that you saw or did in World War II, every time you look at them, you're reminded, and they can ask you about that, they can talk about that. So if you keep quiet about it, you haven't painted your family with that brush that you, they want to forget a lot of the horrible things that, that happened to them, or they saw happen, or that you know, they did. So I think as a stranger, they can tell me you know, things honestly, openly, and, and I, I did not judge them, and I do not judge people. You know, there were times when they're talking about shooting down an American pilot, and it, it made me cringe. You know, I, I think that's that could be someone's dad, that's someone's uncle, right? Could be someone, and so it was it was difficult for me at times to listen to their stories and not kind of make a face or go, Ooh, you know. So I tried really hard to try to be neutral because to me this was history. No one's done this before. No one's got their experiences in their own language in their own homes. And I didn't want to taint that or sour that with my own you know, personal opinions or feelings. So to the best of my ability, I presented their experiences just as they told them to me. A little bit of background information, kind of put it in the context, but these are their stories. And then one last question, gentlemen. Uh, did you get the sense in their communication with you knowing that you were going to be taking this back? for American readers, or at least English language readers, anything that you felt they were trying to emphasize that they, they wanted us to know? Yes, good, thank you. All of them talked about all the fact that they really love America, mm -hmm. and they appreciate what happened after the war. Because America came in, rebuilt the cities, rebuilt the schools, we handed off bread, <coughs> and dehydrated milk, and chocolates, and we didn't enslave them. They expected to become slaves or taken back to America with forced labor. Instead, we came in with you know, both hands full of goods and snacks and candies and treats and money. And they said, we, we felt that we were ashamed by what we thought you would do and what you did. And the friendship that has lasted all these decades, we never turned our back on Japan. But every veteran said they didn't hate America before the war started. In fact, two of them said they thought it was a really bad idea to attack America because they, they had no you know, how, how, how powerful we were, uh, and there was no animosity. Uh, unlike Korea and, and China, where there's hundreds of years of problems and tension, like the British and French, Japan and America, there was nothing between us. And that was the message I thought, was that they wanted to, to let American readers know that they, as old men, never felt hatred or uh, anger towards the American people.
I'm sorry, I didn't realize there's one last question, a gentleman at the end, and then we'll finish up. Oh, yeah, Greg, how did you track down all of these people? You know, I, I would meet one veteran, and he'd say, you know, I've got a friend you might want to talk to. And it just goes out like that. And so I knew it was very important for me to keep my reputation going, as to be respectful and courteous to them, and to record their story, I believe need this, I'd record them on. Um, and once again, ne never make like a sour face, or let me give him one of these. Because he would say, oh, don't, don't let this guy interview you, because he's going to make you feel bad. Um, and in doing so, I learned a lot about their, their terminology, uh, their military terms, the history of them. And so when they would talk about certain things, then I, I'd understand the big notes. But it, it started off just one or two, and trickle out. And it, it keeps on growing from there. I appreciate you all very much. and they'll talk about their personal experience in war. Once again, I want to thank you, um, thank the service clubs in the city, the C Civic Club, Rotary Club, Community Service Foundation, and Friends of the Library. Without their support, none of this would be possible. Thank you very much for coming. Have some refreshments, and if you're interested in purchasing the book, it's a special price of $20 today. Thank you.